welcome to the Pittsburgh City Council's Cablecast public hearing for Thursday, March 5th, 2020. My name is Louise Chris, and with us today is Dan Deaver, our sign language interpreter. The public hearing will be on the following legislation. Bill 57, Ordinance Amending the City of Pittsburgh Code of Ordinances, Title II, Fiscal, Article 5, Special Funds, Chapter 237, the City of Pittsburgh Parks Trust Fund to conform with the rule, Home Rule Charter Article 9 in order to establish the creation of the Pittsburgh Parks Trust Fund, sponsored by Council Member Coghill and Council Member Gross. And Bill 91, ordinance providing funding for the City of Pittsburgh Parks Trust Fund through a 0.5 mil increase to the property tax rate by adding section 263.04 City of Pittsburgh Parks Trust Fund Levy at Title II Fiscal Article 9 Property Taxes Chapter 263 Real Property Tax and Exemption. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Good, e good evening. If everyone could please take their seats. Um, we're going to begin our public hearing today. So good evening and welcome to Pittsburgh City Council's public hearing for Thursday, March 5th, 2020, regarding bills 57 and 91. Would a clerk please read the title of the bill? Bill 57, Ordinance Amendment of City of Pittsburgh, Code of Ordinances, Title II, Fiscal Article 5, Special Funds. Chapter 237, the City of Pittsburgh's Park Trust Fund to conform with the Home Rule Charter, Article 9, in order to establish the creation of the Pittsburgh Parks Trust Fund, Bill Number 91, in ordinance providing funding for the City Parks Trust Fund through a 0 0.50 mil increase to the property tax rate by adding Section 26304, City of Pittsburgh Park Trust Fund Levy at Title II, Fiscal Article 9, Property Taxes, Chapter 263, Real Property Tax and Exemption. Thank you. For the record, we are joined today by Council Members, Council President Smith, Councilman Krause, Councilman Wilson, Councilwoman Deborah Gross, and Councilman Coghill. Other members may um, periodically walk into the meeting. Other members have other meetings this evening, so they'll probably watch this when they get home this evening. We will now move on to testimony from registered speakers. When you come to the podium, please give your name and address for the public record. Each speaker will be given three minutes to address council. If you did not register in advance, after we have exhausted the list of registered speakers, you will be given an opportunity to speak and you will be given one minute to speak. Our first speaker in favor is, and I apologize in advance if I mispronounced anyone's name. Our first speaker is Adam Pervade followed by Patrick Gian Janella. Thank you. <laughs> Is Adam Pervade here? Is Patrick Gianella here? After Mr. Gianella will be Julia Shea Merrick. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I begin speaking, I, I brought copies of my statements for counsel if I may. Give them to the clerk, please. Thank you. I also brought these children from my community as a teaching moment for them and for counsel. I wanted counsel to see my community represented here and show uh, them that they shouldn't be held hostage to the decisions of the PPC <clears throat> or the previous problems that was created by your forefathers on council. So if I may, my name is Patrick Cianella. Do you think Michael Bloomberg could buy an election? You need to look no further than down the hallway to Mayor Peduto's office and across the table at these PPC executives, some making over $100,000 and the CEO making over $200,000, who bought this legislation with a $1 million propaganda campaign that promised matching funds that don't exist. Ask Corey O'Connor. If the minority parks are in shambles, then they and Mayor Peduto are to blame. Since they said at your last meeting they have been partners for 24 years with the city, and Mayor Peduto is on the board, 
and worked with them since he was on council. Their proposal for $12 million in administrative fees are outrageous, especially when we have a director of the DPW and employees to do the work in our parks. Our taxpayers' money should not leave this room, and especially not be dictated by a nonprofit as to where it goes. That's why you were elected to protect our money and interests. Mount Washington has been waiting nine years for our shelter house, and not one park is even on the PPC proposal for at least the next six years. I'm asking you to reject this proposal and distribute the money equally. If they want to help the minority communities first, then let them may or Purdue use the matching funds they promised us taxpayers during their lives to get this legislation passed. The PPC is going to line their pockets with this money and that of their friends' companies who financed and supported this legislation. The city claims they have the money to fix Olympia Park, finally remove our porta johns and fix the bathrooms for our youth programs, but not the personnel to do so. So instead of giving the money to a nonprofit who hires their friends and their companies to do what Jane Miller said was happening in the first appearance here, hire union city employees that were let go when we were in state oversight to repair our parks. In our last appearance here, Mrs. Miller said 45 more DPW employees could be hired with this money. That's where our taxes could go, not to her. That's where this council should start, along with the necessary tools for each community. Each district would be immediately be assigned five permanent maintenance and personnel to do any work requested by you in your district parks. We all know that this was a sneaky backdoor home rule charter change, not a tax. Your legacy on council depends on you doing the right thing for all our taxpayers now and in the future, not pushing a nonprofit's proposal on our city. Take your time, do it right, because we, the taxpayers, will be watching, and you'll be stuck with this partisan Protestant tax forever. Thank PPC you. had two years and $1 million to present their case. Thank you, and sir. And we're giving the people that have to pay this tax for the rest of our lives three minutes. Think about that before you vote where this sir, money should go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, we have been joined by Councilwoman Strasburger. Is Julia Shea Merrick here? Followed by John Steffen. You can start coming to the podium. Hi, my name's Julia Shea Myrick. Myrick, sorry. I live at 803 uh, Bay Ridge Avenue in Brookline, City Council District 4. And our household enjoys visiting Brookline Memorial Rec Center, Moore Park, and Moore Pool. Uh, some other parks that we visit are Riverview, Shenley, Frick, and Highland. Uh, those parks are in greater need of repair than the spaces close to our home in Brookline. Sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> because the need is not equal, the funds collected from the parks tax should not be distributed equally. That's all. Thank you. Should not be. Good evening. I'm John Stephen, 332nd Street. I. Uh, uh, come this evening speak on behalf of the Negley Run Watershed Task Force. Um, the task force is an interagency collaboration uh, to engage community creatives and professionals in ur urban ecosystem re re regeneration. Participants in the task force include leaders from the communities ho of Homewood, Larimer, Highland Park, Lincoln Lemington, and North Point Breeze. And a, uh, a critical element of 21st century rainwater stewardship and flood mitigation is smart maintenance and use of open space and parks. And Nagley Run Watershed, as you all know, um, is uh, channeled by, uh, by the uh, Washington Boulevard and suffered the tragedy of the two 2011 floods. So the task force has come together to think creatively about how everyone can work together to, uh, to mitigate that problem and to uh, address uh, urban redevelopment needs in the 21st century. Unfortunately, Negley Run Watershed does have parks and open spaces and slopes and woods that all need attention and stewardship. Baxter Park, Chaswick Park, Westinghouse Park, Homewood Field are all benefits to the community. Um, that's just a, a few of the neighborhood parks. And all of these parks in the neighborhoods funnel down, of course, through Highland Park. And that provides the conveyance for the future uh, water floodway to, or uh, stormwater conveyance down to the Allegheny River. These parks provide multiple quality of life benefits and ecosystem services, but that is undermined without stewardship and care. Hence, I spoke on behalf of the task force in support of the park plan and the need for more park funding in this same forum in October. 
It was our understanding that we were voting at that point on funding pursuant to the parks plan. And it, it was true then, and it is a very logical starting point now. The parks plan encompasses important equity, stewardship, and restoration principles that must be carried forward. It's a, a very good starting point, and we uh, encourage you and applaud you for uh, considering that as a resource and a, uh, a, a starting point as you make some very important decisions for our parks and open spaces going forward. Thank you very much. We, we have Rick Noor, Rick Noor, followed by William K. Hello, my name is Rick Noor. I'm from Brookline. Um, many of you know me here as a regular attendee at council meetings. And um, I just want to explain to people what I have witnessed here in the conversations in front of council because I've attended practically every meeting, if not all meetings, concerning the, pa the parks tax question. Now, I originally was open-minded about it because, quite honestly, the park tax isn't going to hurt me too bad, but I know it's going to hurt people of low and fixed incomes more than me. However, um, I want to go back to the beginning of this that really caught my attention was a meeting that I attended on 9-11-19, that would have been last September, that was attended by members of the mayor's staff, uh, Chief of Staff Dan Gilman, Mike Gable, Department of Public Works, the PPC, and um, council, members of council, and uh, controller Michael Lamb. At that meeting, um, they grilled um, the mayor's office and the PPC pretty good. I'm talking about council. And they asked a lot of serious questions to get to the bottom of uh, answers that weren't out there. But uh, at that meeting, uh, the chief of staff, Dan Gilman, mentioned that there will be full transparency and accountability as far as the uh, use of these funds. However, uh, I came away uh, feeling that they were being uh, misleading, deceptive, and underhanded with their answers to the questions. For example, um, they said full transparency. However, there are serious questions about the Parks Trust Fund Board and their rule as far as dissipating, or um, excuse me, um, uh, using the funds to fix the parks. For example, I went the next night to a PPC meeting and I asked them, I said, nothing's being mentioned about the Parks Trust Fund Board. How many members will be on the board? Uh, how will this board be selected? What are the rules and um, bylaws that will govern this board? They said, we don't know. That was their first response. The next night I went down to one at Carrick. I asked the same questions. So they were a little better prepared this time to answer my question. What they said was, We'll decide this after the referendum is approved and council approves this uh, parks tax when it's finalized. And that was a red flag for me from the beginning. So my question is this, what exactly is the role of the Parks Trust Fund Board? Okay, are they gonna be able to charge user fees? The, the questions are endless here. How do you pre-approve something without knowing what you're doing? Um, and here is another thing. I felt uh, from my observations that there were quite a few um, things that were being done behind doors. And it worries me because I'm concerned about the, um, oh, I'm sorry, am I going over here? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I didn't get in my comments, but my thing is. to the clerk if you okay, have written Sorry comments. about that. No, it's okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, distinguished council persons. My name is Bill Kai. I'm a product of District 4. I'm here on behalf of my mother, who is a resident at 615 Chrysler Street, and I'm also here as a friend, as a trustee with the Brookline Teen Outreach. We work with teenagers. I'm proud to say that at one point in my career, I also served as an aide here for city council, and I worked in our parks and recs and summer programs. I think the question before this council is are we gonna abdicate our authority, our roles to be stewards of the public funds? It's very simple. We don't have to complicate it with authorities or third parties or talks of privatization. We have amongst our own 
city employees. We have amongst our own directors in parks. We have amongst our own people in innovation and performance that are answering to you and in turn, you answer to us, the taxpayers, the people that vote for you. So there has to be, with this ordinance, with any legislation, with any laws, rules, or regulations, equality. We have to think of our city as unified, as one park system, nine districts. It's pretty simple. Allocate the monies, one-ninth, and then prioritize within the districts with public input, with input from the professionals that, again, are serving the public not some third party nonprofit authority. So again, when you think of being a, in a trust fund situation, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're somebody that is charged with a duty under the court to supervise those funds, you have to be open, you have to be transparent, and you have to make sure that all those monies are accounted for. And you have to use reasonable standards in the best interest of the people all of the people. This government serves all the people equally. One city of Pittsburgh, one park system, one city council united. Thank you. Christine Malone, followed by Laura Doyle. Hi, I'm Kristen Malone. I live at 2215 Bensonia Avenue in the Beachview neighborhood of Pittsburgh. And I'm here in favor of uh, Beachview is, um, it's, a, it's an up and coming area. There are um, a relative amount of lower income people that live in Beachview. It's also my, my heart now. I've owned my home there for seven years and I just love it more and more every day. Beachview children really rely on public spaces for play and learning. Um, a lot of homes don't have any yard or green space. Uh, Pauline Park, I actually passed on my way here. I'm able to walk there from my house. and. I'm telling you, regardless of the time of year, there are always children on the basketball courts or on the swings there. It's a wonderful little park. I have a two-year-old. I feel like I'm just relearning so many parts of the city because um, you know, a two-year-old, they want to always be out and play. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm choosing to raise my child in Beachview is because of its walking accessibility to things like parks, uh, restaurants, libraries, you know, the grocery store, and the green space that's there. Um, as I mentioned, being you know, newer to the city, I've also discovered new other areas as well, um, especially around Brookline. We really love Moore Park and Pool, um, amongst others. So um, I ask that you consider some of these areas that might disproportionately be affected if it's equally distributed because we have a lot of children that, you know, it's, it's not their fault if these parks go away. They're not going to have anywhere to play and anywhere to go. So I ask that you consider um, District 4 and some of these areas that really um, need uh, your repairs and upkeep. Thank you. We have Laura Doyle followed by Christine White. Hi, I'm Laura Doyle. I live at 337 Stewart Avenue in Pittsburgh. It's in the Carrick neighborhood. So when I read this uh, uh, referendum on election day, when we voted for it, I, who wouldn't be for this? I mean, it just sounded like such a great idea. And, um, you know, to equitably fund parks and underserved neighborhoods. Carrick is certainly an underserved neighborhood. I'm part of the Carrick Community Council, and we have been hosting events for hundreds and hundreds of children, trying to improve their lives through community experience. We do a Halloween party, an Easter egg hunt, and a light up night. So this year at um, light up night, I spent the entire evening because we had blown all the fuses, plugging in these 100-cup um, coffee makers to make, because we had hot chocolate cookie decorating stations. And so, and we just blew fuses all night long, moving around from place to place. And so I just boiled it in pots and took it out and put it in these urns to keep it warm. And so when we had surveys, we were never asked, like, how's the electrical? It's like, do you like trees? Well, who doesn't like trees? And I don't see that there's going to be equitable funding because there's no money coming to my park. And there's serious need for improvements up at Carrick Park. And we have uh, 10,000 residents in Carrick. It's one of the biggest communities on the hilltop there. And when you look at the results from the survey from the Parks Conservancy, they surveyed 155 people in Carrick out of 10,000. So I just really, I don't trust this legislation. I don't. I trust Anthony. 
I know he's, he comes to every meeting we have. We have a monthly meeting um, for the community. It's a crime watch meeting. He's been there for everyone. He knows what our concerns are. I personally have a concern for litter. I've talked to him about that before. Friday, I was sick. I stayed home from work because I had the flu. Phone rings, it's Anthony. He goes, hey, Laura, I cleaned your street himself. He came out there in his pickup truck and spent four hours and cleaned up all the litter on my street. That's... Yeah, thank you, Anthony. That's a politician that's taken personal responsibility for his area, and that makes me trust him. And so I really want to see this money split up equally between the nine districts. I want our share. I'm not opposed to paying this. I'll pay my fair share. I just want to see my community benefiting from that. So thank you very much. Christine White. Not here? Okay. We have David Hance, followed by Roberta Shope. Is David? Oh, come forward. Good, e good evening. I'm David Hance. I live in Highland Park. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this important matter this evening. Uh, I speak from the perspective of a resident of the city of 33 years, uh, with 30 of those years being involved in, in leadership and uh, team building opportunities in, the major, in, the, in our neighborhood and in the major park nearest us, which is Highland Park. Uh, throughout these years, I've also been involved in the Highland Park Community Council and the Highland Park Community Development Corporation, but I'm here tonight speaking as an individual. Uh, my relationship with the Parks Conservancy goes back to their very earliest days, uh, about 1995. This was the um, period where it was kind of the dark days of the of really major issue, the, the proposed covering of the Highland Park Reservoir. We were building, uh, we needed to build a team uh, that showed that this issue was much bigger than just the neighborhood. The Parks Conservancy stepped up, uh, kind of joined the team, helped raise uh, attention and profile on this really important issue. And Really, that was the beginning of a, of a long-term partnership with the, with the Parks Conservancy where we uh, really understand and appreciate the leadership and the impact they're able to bring to our park, but also other parks around the city. Um, the reservoir today, through that process, came out through a 10-year process and is now uh, still an open reservoir, and it continues to be the major attraction in, in Highland Park. Our neighborhood's partnership with the Parks Conservancy goes back 25 years to this crucial issue and has only become stronger since. Since, since that time, project partnerships have included working with the Conservancy, the state, the city. We were able to restore this, the iconic statues at the entry to Highland Park at Highland, at Highland Avenue, and then that set the stage for the restoration of the entry garden and fountain at Highland, at Highland Avenue. The, the park was really, was really more than a little bit tired and neglected at that point, and the projects helped to raise the bar for quality park interventions. <clears throat> uh, pride in the park picked up as a result, and we see that playing through now with other projects, with uh, the Parks Conservancy playing a key leadership role. This includes the, the Heths Run Restoration Project, uh, a massive, really important project that uh, uh, the Parks Conservancy has helped elevate to the right level of discussion. Um, there's also really key projects going on in the park right now led by PWSA. Again, with the partnership of the, of the Conservancy, we've, um, we're dealing with a much different expectation of quality and the projects at the PWSA, and we want to give them a lot of credit too. Those projects have really turned out uh, great, and then the new ones on the way are, are, uh, are uh, targeted for success. So I want to you know, I hope to show these comments that Parks and Services has been a great partner, um, and we need to see parks funding as not a nice to have for the few, Thank but you. a must have for the many that results in health, economic development, and tax base improvements. Thank you. Thank you. After Ms. Shope is Nikki Turner. Hello, um, good evening, everyone. My name is Roberta Shope. I live on Stanton Avenue in Highland Park. One of the things that bothers me the most about this tax is the way it was passed and that it was the third attempt through a referendum and the second one that worked. 
First we had the library tax, then we had the countywide children's services tax, which failed, and then we had this, which passed. I just feel that a non-governmental organization should not be spending so much money to collect signatures and then relatively easily pass something that you know, was on the ballot in a, an off-year election. Um, Low-income and fixed-income people who are both owners and renters will be affected by this because, of course, landlords pass any taxes they pay on their property onto their tenants. So no one, no resident of Pittsburgh is escaping this. And you might say, what's the big deal? It's half a mil. Well, look how many times this has happened. I, I really feel we need to put a stop to this process that it's just not the right one. If it were possible to pass a law so that our property taxes in particular could not be raised by this method and that instead our elected officials who answer to us would do it, that would just be a lot better. Because maybe the city could have found some money somewhere. Maybe it didn't even have to be half a mil. Maybe it could have been partly done with a sales tax or some other kind of tax. I'm, I'm not opposed to uh, the parks. I love the parks. I think we all do. But the other thing we might need to do is lobby Harrisburg, because I know Pittsburgh and, and really everybody except Philadelphia faces some strictures in terms of how they can raise taxes. And that's a long-term thing, I realize. That's not a short-term thing. But yes, I'm just very disturbed that, um, that this has happened again. And who knows what next great cause, and it could well be a great cause, will be the next one. And, and I just think we really need to be more thoughtful about this. And I really appreciate Councilwoman Gross, her efforts, um, as particularly um, with regard to affordable housing in Pittsburgh, because that is really important for everyone. Thank you. Nikki Turner, followed by Jill Weiss. Someone's coming. Oh. Hi, my name is Jill Weiss. I walk with my dog in Pittsburgh parks every day in small neighborhood parks, but mostly in larger regional one. We're lucky enough to live close enough to do so. Proximity to a large park was definitely one of the reasons we purchased our home over 30 years ago. We walk when it's sunny, cloudy, rainy, and in the snow. We walk on paved and gravel paths and trails in the woods. We see all sorts of people, young, old, and in between, of different sizes, shapes, and colors, from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds and with varying abilities. I see people sitting, walking, running, cycling, climbing trees or on playgrounds, in strollers, and in wheelchairs. I see many of the same people every day, and I see new people every day. We smile, nod, or greet each other, wave, or just keep walking. Lots of people ask what kind of dog I have and want to pet her. There is a sense of community that is created by walking or being in a park. As I walk, I see the beauty of the trees, the babbling brook. I see hawks, blue jays, robins, cedar waxwings, squirrels, chipmunks, deer. I also see broken stairways, stone archways, and other historic landmarks in desperate need of repair. I see closed pools and facilities. I see garbage, broken glass, and empty beer cans. I see outdated and broken equipment and water fountains. It is impossible for the city to be able to re repair all that is needed with the existing funding. The Parks Fund targets all Pittsburgh parks, regardless of size and location, prioritized from the neediest to the healthiest park conditions, ensuring equity throughout the city and addressing existing inequalities. The Parks Conservancy has an amazing track record of past projects undertaken in coordination with the city. Just look at their website to see what has been contributed up to this time. Its mission is to partner and coordinate and to work with the city, not to exist as an entirely independent entity. The funding now designated by the city to maintain the parks is woefully insufficient for the enormous task of repairing, maintaining, and improvement in the, peop um, the wonderful parks of Pittsburgh. Funding the parks is an investment in the people of Pittsburgh. A recent scientific study finds that the magnitude of health gains of just two hours per week spent in nature appear to be significant and on par with the health differences associated between living in a well-off area and a deprived one and apply to everyone regardless of age, gender, long-term illness, or disability. 
Rather than a short-sighted approach, let us agree to have the foresight to support the trust fund and help to ensure the legacy of the parks and the wonderful benefits they contributed to our lives in Pittsburgh. Anthony Moreno, followed by Donna McManus. Anthony Moreno. Good evening, my name's Tony Moreno. Orwell said, the further of government, the further government drifts from the truth and the more it will hate those who speak it. I know this is true because I've spoke the truth to this administration my entire career as a Pittsburgh police officer until I retired, and everybody hates me for it. We citizens are being disenfranchised by our leaders that are elected to protect us. After being intentionally deceived by the carefully worded, never spoke up before ballot initiative, a parks tax has been narrowly passed and we know nothing more about a plan, the details, or how it will work. This is vague by design. An unknown conservancy will receive tens of millions of dollars a year and spent on unknown projects by unknown non-city, non-union workers. I have concerns that the conservancy is not answerable to the people who pay the bills. As this discussion continues, you must know that relentless and unattainable anger mounts in Pittsburgh by its citizens. District 4 in Brookline and the area neighborhoods get zero dollars according to the plan. District 8 in the Oakland area neighborhoods get zero dollars according to the plan. Northside gets zero dollars according to the plan. Bill Peduto pushed this financial support and leverage of the mayor's office to get Bobby Wilson elected because he bought his silence. Darlene Harris would have never allowed this to happen. Northside gets shut out of parks funding. All the while, District 7, the Strip District, Lawrenceville and Highland Park gets $40 million of this money. We're not stupid. We're out, and we're going to vote you out. You have all revealed yourselves. You don't care about us. You care about your own agenda. When I'm the mayor of Pittsburgh, I'll treat all 90 neighborhoods with dignity and respect and make us one great Pittsburgh. We need to make sure we take care of ourselves and make sure that this money is taken care of and we all Keep on this because they are taking this money and they're going to spend it however they want if we don't stay here. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President, Council Members. My name is Donna McManus. I'm a homeowner and resident in the Carrick neighborhood of Pittsburgh. Let me start by saying I am completely opposed to this park tax. However, I believe in the democratic process and therefore the park tax is here to stay. With that being said, the question now is who, who is responsible for the decision making and disbursement of the funds? The understanding is that the Parks Conservancy would control the revenue generated by the tax. A nonprofit special interest group making decisions regarding public money. How is this legal? Where is the transparency? Where is the accountability? Given the $1 million advertising campaign to get the voters to support this legislation, I am skeptical of the Parks Conservancy's intentions to solely put the money into improving our parks. Public money should stay in the public's hands. The park tax revenue should be divided equally between the nine council districts and Pittsburgh City Council should be the governing body who makes the decisions and disperses the funds. That way, there would be transparency and accountability. Transparency in the form of open meetings and citizens' true accurate input. Accountability in the action that if the public does not agree with the council's distribution of the park revenue, residents have the, residents have the option of voting council members out of office. That's accountability. Public money needs to stay in the public's hands. Getting back to the Parks Conservancy Plan, in which they shared with the neighborhoods last summer, McKinley Park was the only park in the south end of the city that was included in their parks plan. Phillips Park, the park in my neighborhood, 
is in serious disrepair that did not make their list. A leaking roof, potholes in the driveway, outside stucco cracking and falling off of the building, poor outdoor lighting, broken handrails on the outs outside steps, and a faulty electrical system in the gym are just a few, just a few of the problems we have at Phillips Park. The families in my neighborhood utilize the services and programs offered at Phillips Park. In addition to the number of people who participated in those services and programs, over 1,000 community members have attended events hosted by the Care Community Council over in the past year at Phillips Park. I would say that the Carrick residents support Phillips Park. Now it's time for the city of Pittsburgh to do the same. Thank you. David Demko, followed by Mickey Underwood. Good evening, City Council. Uh, my name is David Demko. I'm the Assistant Director of Scenic Pittsburgh, and um, I support the, uh, uh, the parks tax. Um, of course, I'm a Bernie Sanders socialist, so um, I believe that we should all kick in and pay for the things that we all enjoy together. Um, you, you know, at, at my house, um, my wife says to me, the house needs painted. And of course, I'm against it because I'm the guy that's got to come up with the funds and the time and the energy to do it. But in my house, my wife carries a majority. It's a slim majority, but she wins the vote, and I end up painting the house. And, but in the end, the house needed painted, and in the end, we're richer for that. We're, we're better off for that. Um, so it's a good thing. Um, there's two things here that, that I've been hearing that I'm, I'm disturbed about. And, and one is the idea that this was somehow done underhandedly or was done in secret, um, that the public didn't have enough information. There's really no more transparent way than a referendum in order to get something passed. And um, uh, it, it just, it, just in the idea that, that, it, that it's secret, um, uh, it, it, just, it just really is. The, the uh, Parks Conservative took a big risk uh, pursuing this. Um, if they had lost it, you'd be all be saying how stupid the Parks Conservancy was, and Jane would be back on her way back to Minnesota. But that's not what happened. And, and, and so now, um, Bernie Sanders is going to win the nomination. I'm going to have to suck it up. And those of you who opposed the referendum, now you're going to have to suck it up. The other thing that I find disturbing is that for some reason we're this whole movement of austerity, that we can't afford these things. This city is booming right now. We have more jobs than ever. Wages are at the highest level. Developers want to come here and spend their money. Now is the time we're supposed to be making investments in the, thing that make, in the things that make a city great, in the things that make a city beautiful. So I urge you um, to uh, uh, pass uh, the legislation necessary to rebuild our parks in the city. Thank you very much. I just I want to remind everyone that after you say your name, please either state your address and or the neighborhood you're from. We need it for public record. Hi. Thank you, Well, Thank you for having me. Hi, City Council. Hi, everybody. Hey. I'm Mickey Trapolsi Underwood. I was the Senate Director from Brookline Park for a century. <laughs> I was also the Community Recreation Supervisor. Now, I understand that this is a done deal, this park tax. I disagree with it. I really do. The people that are paying for it are also paying for other things. We continue to be burdened. The city of Pittsburgh taxpayers are continuing to carry the region. Um, I didn't see Green Tree pay for this. I, I didn't see Wilkinsburg pay for this. All right, they use our parks. We don't ask them for a dime. I say the county. The entire county should pay for it, not the city. We don't need to carry the entire region. And for everybody out there, enjoy it, because that's what's happening. Now, that being said, with this being a done deal, it should be equally distributed. Everybody gets their piece of the action. You get your 10%, we have nine districts. Pay for them. Have some equity. Brookline Park needs bathrooms. We have thousands of people that go through that neighborhood park a day, a week. It was me counting them, so I know they're real. I wasn't lying. They're real. 
Carrick Park, this woman was 100% right. It's well used. And I can name you every park that's well re reused. The park that they displayed in the ad, Jefferson, Paulson, the city has already put millions into it. That's a fib, folks. Another one from Parks Conservancy, they're telling some good fibs. It's for the kids. It's for everybody. Everybody's heartstrings are pulled by it. Please send that money equally to each district. I can't do anything about it now, but I will work to overturn this tax. Better government, not more government. Better government. And as far as these people working for Parks Conservancy, they don't live in the city. They have no dog in the fight. Where do they live? How much do they make? What's your Senate director make? Your Senate director make, um, I'd say, one third of what your directors in Parks Conservancy make. It's not right. It's really not right. Invest in your own people. Put the money back into your own people and put your money back into your communities. Thank you. Yvonne, Yvonne Brown, followed by John Canning. John Canning, followed by Alex Crago. Uh, my name is John Cannon, and I'm a resident of uh, the North Side, uh, 22nd Ward, I think. <laughs> uh, I've been a resident of the North Side for a little bit more than 80 years. I've been a park user in every decade of my lifetime. As a youngster, I spent many days in Riverview Park, swimming, hiking, as part of a YMCA day camp, and believe it or not, for a short time as a jogger. I learned a great deal about the importance of the natural setting of our parks. Numerous programs in the Wekahika Nature Cabin that was once located in Riverview Park. It's gone now. It's never been replaced. For the past 50 years, I've lived nearby the Allegheny Commons Park, where I played a bit of tennis, taught my children and grandchildren to ride a bike, spent many hours with our daughters and granddaughters at playgrounds, took our dogs for regular daily walks, swam in the Sumeri pool, helped with community park beautification efforts, and ate well over a thousand ice balls at Gus's cart in the park. I'm a park user and I'm a park enthusiast. When in any city park, I'm always conscious, and I visit a variety of neighborhoods in this city as I drive around, and I've learned that how many city residents use parks every day in every season. They're used by residents and non-residents. They're used by property owners. They add, the parks add to the quality of life throughout the city and to the value of properties in every neighborhood located nearby a park well-kept or a parklet. Over the past 10 years, I was happy to see the improvements to several of our large city parks, which are the result of our city's government and the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy working together for the benefit of the city. However, I must say in the last decade, the ability of the city, of the city itself to care for these parks has slowly diminished. Other needs, very essential needs, have resulted in lower budgets for the parks. And I understand that, because there's other things city money has to be used for. There's fewer staff working in the parks to keep the parks at a high level of care. That's why I precisely have supported the Parks Task Initiative. And that's why I'm here this evening. Public parks, like public libraries, are free to the people. They are what add quality to the lives of park and library users. They should be, they could be first on the chopping block, as a number of people have said here tonight. They would chop the hell out of these parks in order to save a penny in their taxes. If there was no dedicated income stream for growth and maintenance, the tax was authorized by the majority of the city's voters who voted last spring. 
and this tax Thank was not slipped Thank through. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. Thank you very much. After Alex Crago is Frank Rozo. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Members. My name is Alex Crago. I am reside at 2301 Pinsonia Avenue, Pittsburgh. I stand in opposition of the city parks tax. I do not stand in opposition of the parks and the beautification of the parks. For years, I have, with um, assistance with the United Way, we have went to parks and we have beautified the parks. We have cleaned them up. So the parks are an essential part of the community. The reason I stand in opposition of the tax is because of the fact the uh, advertisements made, it made it sound like there would be a mere $50 increase on property taxes. This is false because most homes are assessed through a poor ass assessment system at more than $100, I mean $100,000 price. So the estimated $10 million is, a sh is short of the reality of the monies that will be generated and is supposed to be matching funds, which will not be there. There are problems with this tax. The funds are put into a trust. The city is supposed to oversee the trust, the distributions of the funds, the equability of the distributions of the fund, and it also states city council, which is all of you, will approve the monies be spent from the trust funds. There is no matching funds. There's no transparency. As David said back there, the transparency is the, the referendum. I stand at the polls, and I have to explain referendums because of the way that they're worded. So that's that point that he made. I just don't understand it. The majority of, of the concerns is where the money's from the taxes and where residents now pay. The Allegheny Regional Assets District, which is, which is the tax that we residents contribute to that 1% that threw on top of our 6% of Allegheny sales tax, that was supposed to have been part of, of this funding for the, um, for the parks, and it seems like it's a dual tax. Now that we have a minimum of $10 million, how does that equate if we do not hire more workers to do the job? Is the city prepared to hire more good union workers to complete this, these projects? That's what we need here. We don't need outside people coming in. If we have the monies, we can't get the projects completed, where do we stand? Okay, a private company imposed a tax on our city residents. That is your job. That's not for a private fund to come in and raise taxes on, on our people. Thank you for listening. After Mr. Rozo is Elizabeth Siemens. My name is Frank Rozo, 1617 Brookline Boulevard, 15226. Uh, good evening, everybody, council, president, and council. Uh, we have Councilman Cargill's our councilman. You know, you don't, some know me don't. I'm a very private person, but someone is bashing to everybody. Let's let council, they're listening to all your complaints. They'll, they'll, they got it in their hands, they know too. Councilman Lavelle, February 19th. I remember you sitting there and saying, you're just not for your place, you're for everybody. You council people represent Brookline, wherever. So instead of for this, that, the parks, I've been involved in the Brookline Community Center since 1972. As Mickey said, I've worked Brookline Little League. I was a council, I was a president up there for 10 years. We had a good program. Times are different today, people. The money's not there. So let's let council, you they got all your complaints and moaning and croning. That, that's not getting out. You beef about the mayor. I wouldn't want none of your jobs. You beef about the council uh, executive, Rich Fitzgerald. If you don't like them, come, come to an election, run them out. But don't sit here and bash everybody. Your people here, we got elected. Have, have faith in them. They know what to do. Again, other than that, thank you. For the record, we are also joined by Councilman O'Connor. After Ms. Siemens is Tony Guarin, 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 Guarino. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, my name is Elizabeth Siemens, and I come from Point Breeze. And I came here with a long list of things to say, but I'm hearing so much feeling coming out of District 4. And I just wanted to say one thing, which is, I, I, I don't know any better than you all do, and it's a democracy and everybody has their voice. But I urge you to think twice about this districting thing because I live in the East End and we have already got these gorgeous parks. We are well equipped. You should get more Ms. than Siemens, us. You need to address and council. Are, I'm sorry, you, your comments are for council. All right. But they're the ones I want to. <laughs> they, they will hear right. you, but you have to address council. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Excuse okay. me. I, I apologize, of course. Anyway, there are districts that need this more than other districts do. And I have dealt with the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy for over 15 years in very, very serious business. And I will tell you, I have fought them at times with all my might, and with all my might's pretty mighty, frankly. And they have responded. So I just urge you to think, in addition to other things that are being stated here today, you need more than what the East End needs. I think asking for equitable might be something you might come to regret. And I want you to think in your own neighborhoods about your library. Just have a moment of silence about your library. No one can ever cut it. No one can, the, politics come and go, good times, bad times, stock market, who cares? The library's there for you. A book and a tree, a book and a tree. For the elders, for the children, it's worth it. The Conservancy and, and, and the library, I, you won't be sorry. I promise you. Sorry. I... Thank you. After Mr. Garino is Michael Milch. Good evening, members of City Council. My name is Tony Garino, 614 LaRoche Street in Brookline. And our city councilman representing the 4th District, Anthony Coghill, asked if I would share my thinking regarding this issue. I'm a lifelong resident of Brookline, and Moore Park sits in the 36th District of the 19th Ward, which my wife and I are former Allegheny County Democratic Committee people. I was fortunate to have grown up at Moore, spending time as my wife and our, uh, and, and our three daughters. Although they no longer live in the neighborhood, on occasion, I bring our three granddaughters back to enjoy the surroundings in order to give them a little idea of their roots. Back in August of 2019, we celebrated the 80th anniversary of Moore Park, established in 1939, of which I organized. When the idea came to me, I immediately knew that I would need the city's assistance, so my first call was to my councilman, Mr. Coghill. I also know that to build a sense of community, it takes more than just money. It takes neighborhood, government, and business working together in order to get things done. That's exactly how we accomplish it, working together to achieve one common goal. Uh, the estimated 2,000 people who returned that day to enjoy the festivities, His Honor Mayor Peduto was one of them and took the time to address the crowd. I recall his heartfelt words as he spoke so eloquently if I had more parks all around the city, like more, no pun intended, there would be less stress, anger, drug abuse, and violence. While working with Councilman Coghill and his staff, who directed me, I'd like to thank uh, those that helped the great people from special events, city parks, public works, public safety, who walk the walk every day without the fanfare, just out there doing their thing. It was a pleasure to observe how they dedicated themselves to their jobs. Another organization that I reached out to, Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy, they were certainly willing to help, but as a nonprofit, and understandably so, they were limited as to how much mon monetary assistance they could provide. Ultimately, they, they did participate with a sponsorship donation, and we were honored to have them as part of the day. Now that the Parks Tax Initiative has been passed and there will be dollars available to share between all nine districts, we have a new starting point. I suggest we don't squabble or not get caught up 
on who received more or less in the past or the future. From my experience, not only in my case with Mr. Coghill being a point of contact in District 4, but I suggest to all council district representatives that they work together within their neighborhoods to better achieve the sense of community. Thank you. Michael Milch, followed by Gordy Sullivan. Is Mr. Milch here? If not, Gordy Sullivan. Followed by Zena Scott. Good evening, everyone. It's Gordon Sullivan, 146 Spencer Avenue. Great neighborhood of Carrick. Thank you. All right, the council here. First off, the tax was a sham by our mayor. Parks Conservancy spent a lot of money to get this on the ballot. That money could have been spent on the parks instead of spending a million dollars to get people to go door to door to get this referendum. Then the day after, if I remember correctly, it was either the Heinz or Hillman Foundation supposedly donated $500,000, if that's what I'm thinking of on that one, to the Parks Conservancy like this wasn't planned. This is public tax money. It should not be turned over to any private organization it will stay it would, under Pittsburgh City Council's direction to be spent on all parks, not just Central or East End parks. Our Phillips Park, which people have talked about building, is a mess. Needs wiring, roof repairs, etc. Why is this not on the list? Better spending and oversight of city tax dollars already of the money now in the budget should be worked out. In fact, I don't think any park in the South Hills is on the list, except they said McKinley prove me wrong. Again, it would behoove Council to keep this money under their care. This should benefit all parks. If you vote to turn it over, we will remember. Don't turn it into the Rad Parks debacle mess. I know a lot about it because I'm a retired Public Works employee. Thank you for your time. After Ms. Scott is Dan Cunningham. Good evening, everyone. I'm Zena Scott, 438 Rosedale Street, 9th District. I um, have sat here and listened to people, and I'm from that community that can't afford to pay the extra taxes. We can. We will. We need it badly. Three of our parks were the top parks on the list because the city hasn't done anything for us in Homewood. And that's a real issue with us. If this gets taken off of our parks and some of them don't have bathrooms to be improved, our basketball courts to be improved, it will be a disgrace to the city council. Racism in this city is alive and well. Do not keep taking stuff from the black community. We vote also. In saying that, I'm looking at what you want to do with the parks. We have a park that the kids can't play in at all. Baxter Park cannot be used at all for anyone, adults or children. You guys should all shake your head and lower it in shame. Along with that, there's no bathroom there for the kids to use if it was able. Give us a break. Don't keep taking from us. When you look at Children's Hospital, 50% of the children that go into Children's Hospital with respiratory problems come from Homewood. 50% due to lack of trees, lack of recreation areas for the kids to play in. Do they not have a right for a good park area? We have a group coming in that's working to put money together to rebuild Stargill Park. The sad part about that, it's an outside group. It's not the city of Pittsburgh. So give us our park money, restruct the parks that need to be done in Homewood, and stop the squabbling. Thank you. Dan, Dan Cunningham, followed by Jim Griffin. I'd like to thank you for uh, allowing me the time to speak tonight. My name is Dan Cunningham. 
I am a lifelong resident of Pittsburgh, except for the few years I spent at IUP. Um, I'm going to change up a little bit of what everybody's been talking. Part of our parks involves youth sports. I am the president of Brookline Youth Hockey League. I have been involved with Brookline Little League and softball and Brookline soccer through my kids for the last 15 years. Seven years ago, going on seven years ago, the Penguins Foundation, Highmark, and the city of Pittsburgh came together and put a deck hockey rink to play ball hockey in Brookline Memorial Park. At that time, we were told when the deck was completed, we would get indoor bathrooms, we would have an area where we could sell concessions, that the park would, that the deck would even be maintained. We were given a key to use the old pool guard shack. Our deck sits on old Brookline pool. It's gone. They filled it in and they put a deck down. They gave us the key to the restrooms and the uh, guard shack from the old pool. They are unoperable. I host with the people over at Team Pitt in Brighton Heights tournaments where people from not only the Allegheny County area come in, but they'll come in from New Jersey, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago. They bring revenue into Pittsburgh because they're coming to these, these, these tournaments. Their kids, especially the little ones, aren't just there for the hockey. They're there to get onto the playground. They're there to walk around the park. They're there to play baseball. I said I was part of baseball for, for many years with my kids. Uh, Mike Messina is here with me with baseball. They raised $70,000 a couple years ago to redo all of the fields on their own. The Pirates helped them out, a lot of private funding, but they worked to do that. And it wasn't a city company that did it. They had to find somebody else outside the city to do it. Our hockey organization is young. We're six years old. In that six years, we've taken our little community and competed nationally. There are 17 current players or former players who have played in Brookline hockey that have either already gone or will be going this summer, as long as the coronavirus doesn't hit them, to go play for Team USA teams. We are building something over there. We have a, that pool hall or the pool rec area has tarps and plastic bins covering all the stuff that we need because it leaks constantly. And there's no place for these folks to go to the bathroom except the Porta Johns that we rent. Thank you very much for your time. Please spread this out evenly throughout this, the city. Jim Griffin. Dan Kaneen. After Dan Kaneen is Martin Davis. Hello, my name is Dan Kaneen. I'm a lifelong resident of the city of Pittsburgh also. The last 42 years, I'm sorry, last 62 years, it was in Brookline, 1605 Bel Air Avenue. And I did not vote for the, for the park tax. I didn't vote for it, but it passed. That's fine with me. I will pay my fair share. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll pay my fair share, and I'm hoping that eventually District 4 gets their fair share of this tax. Now, from what I understand is that this tax is going to bring in about <clears throat> 10 to $11 million a year. Well, I was always told I'm a pretty simple guy. And to me, it looks like a pretty simple fix here. You have nine districts. You got 10 or $11 million coming in every year. That's about $1.1 million per district. And who better to spend that money and get that money are you council people for each district? Because who knows better about what needs done in their district but you council people in the district. Now, if you get your $1.1 million a year, you put it where you need it, where your, your people in your district tell you you need it. Hey, you can't spend it this year. Next year, guess what? You'll get $1.1 million again. My biggest fear is that you are not going to have a say-so where this money goes. 
Mayor Perduto may have a say so where this money goes. But God forbid us all if that happens, because we know where that money's going to go. You know, you districts in the west, in the south, in the north, forget about it. You may get a little bit of that money, but it ain't going to be all. And like Mr. Cunningham just said about the deck hockey, that was, that's a beautiful deck hockey ring up there. It sits on the old pool, and that pool was in Brookline Park. In, in Moore Park, or not Moore Park, I'm sorry, that was the Brookline Community Center. A great pool, and I'm sure a lot of us spent time at that pool. One year, come April, there was no water in the pool. We were all wondering why there ain't no water in the pool. Two years, there ain't no water in the pool. We were told that there was a crack in the pool. Well, I'm not an engineer. It ain't that hard to fix a, a crack in a cement pool. But we were told we didn't have the money. It went for about five years, and then it was filled in, and now we have a hockey ring there. I know my time is running down here. Mr. Coghill, thank you for being our councilman. In District 4, we finally have a council person who looks out for the whole District 4. Not like some of the past councilmen who looked out for part of District 4. I want to thank you and you're doing a great job. Thank you very much. Hello, Council. Uh, my name is Martin Davis, and I live at 2214 Beechwood Boulevard. There was an election and a vote on a referendum, and it passed. Now, uh, you're responsible, and the Parks Conservancy is responsible to figure out how to best spend the money that will be raised. A couple of bullet points I'd like to mention. Uh, I think you all know that the Parks Conservancy has raised and spent many millions of dollars in the last decades uh, and done some fantastic projects. The city of Pittsburgh is a city of wonderful neighborhoods, and we're very lucky to be that way. But it is more than the sum of those neighborhoods. It's a city. And the parks in one neighborhood benefit people from many neighborhoods. Hearing everyone speak tonight, I've no doubt that Council and the Parks Conservancy need to work a little more effectively on a plan that will provide something that is more equitable. But I say this from experience, equal is not always equitable. And that's what has to be decided, is how to equitably use this money. The Parks Conservancy has been fiscally responsible and has been supported by many people and the major foundations in the Pittsburgh area. Not because they weren't doing good things, not because they were incompetent, and not because they could not work with the city. All of these projects in the park involved working with the city. Now we have more funds for a public-private group to effectively move us forward. I've heard many people speak tonight who all say how great it is to have parks. That's what it is, and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Kenneth Reynolds. Kenneth Reynolds. <laughs> Kenneth Reynolds. Michelle Trafficant, Georgia Nicola, George, I'm sorry. Good evening. My name is George Nicola. I live on Dunster Street in Brookline. Everyone here has addressed the tax issue. I'm not really worried about that. You guys have got to take care of that. I'm here to talk about the problems up at the Brookline Rec Center that never get fixed. And I've been going there for at least 10 years. I pay $5 a month. Where's that money go? I don't know. Uh, the treadmill's broken. The bicycles are broken. The elliptical machines are broken. All the pads on all the machines are terrible. Uh, I just wanted to know what was going to happen with that, if we could fix that, if we're going to get a little extra money. I'd sure like to see something to do with that. And uh, I do like the parks. I enjoy the parks. I ride a bicycle on the bike trails. I work out, I run down there. Anyways, thank you for your time. Have a good night. Thank you, thank you. Lisa, Lisa Orlando. Lisa, she's not.
Jim Boland. Jim Boland. Tommy Wasco after Jim Boland. Good evening, Council. My name is James Bowen, long, long time resident of Carrick. I'd like to start by saying I was first, was, and still against this tax for a number of reasons. This tax was a blatant backdoor tax put forth by a private organization with the backing of the mayor's office, which didn't have the backbone to introduce a new tax on their own. So why not put it on a group to introduce a new tax? They spent $1 million to promote and get this tax approved. We, the taxpayers, could not match the spending to oppose this tax. This tax directly affects property owners and therefore should have been voted on by property owners only. Furthermore, there is no valid reason that the money from this tax should be managed by a non-government private organization. City Council should oversee the allocation, prioritization, and approval of all spending in all nine districts while recognizing that all districts shall receive equal funding every year. Every year this tax is still needed, all nine council districts shall receive equal amounts of funding because this is a tax for all of Pittsburgh and as such funding for the parks. Our capital budget should still have funding in place for the parks. Our RAD parks already receive RAD funding, which is not available to the smaller neighborhood parks. Therefore, RAD parks should be excluded from this park tax fund. In my district alone, we have neglected playgrounds, ball fields that are in need of improvement. We also have rec centers that are unusable when it rains due to leaky roofs and flooded gym floors. This tax was narrowly approved 51 to 49 percent margin with only 25 percent of the Pittsburgh region voting on this tax. So now it is up to make sure that we are getting our equal fair share in all districts every year. I ask all nine council members to oversee, allocate equal funding to Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy to address all of our parks every year equally. Thank you for taking time to listen to what I have to say. I hope you carefully consider the opinions, needs of all Pittsburgh residents when making your decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Tommy Waska. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Tom Wasco, um, resident of 2405 Isler Avenue, Pittsburgh, 15210. Spent my entire life in the Carrick area, uh, Anthony Cockhill's District 4. So um, looking around the room, I was going to say I'm uh, uniquely qualified to speak on this issue, that I would be uh, one of the uh, older uh, park member users, but I see I'm not. I'm just <laughs> falling in the middle of that category. But I'm. Uh, 33 years working in the South Hills of Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire, uh, also throughout the city. Um, I, again, am uh, qualified to speak on the parks issues. 21 years volunteering at the Care Community Athletic Association in the form of coaching and board of directors. Also, 36 years refereeing high school football, small college football, down to the uh, lower levels of midget league football. This is where I found out, first of all, uh, the lack of funding going into our city parks. Um, also, I'd like to reiterate uh, what a member of the um, Brookline community brought up about the, um, the hockey uh, rink in um, Brookline and the, uh, the lack of uh, facilities there. So I also, along with uh, refereeing high school football, refereeing flag football on a regional and national level, and uh, I can tell you that our city just doesn't compare to very close cities in, in Ohio and Maryland and West Virginia and New York. Just can't compare. But we've held and scratched and held a tournament in the city of Pittsburgh uh, um, and just outside as much as we could. And this is the first year it's not coming here. And the, f the, the reason is because of lack of facilities. And um, that's something that this park tax should address. Um, as, as a whole group, it can address that area. Uh, but I also want to get back to the fact that um, it seems like we're, I could speak for 33 minutes here because of my talking points, but we've, we've gone over them. But um, I'm not trying to pit communities against communities, but I see in the 4th District, it seems to me that we've got the short end of the stick for many, many years. Um, if you want to go back to uh, Councilman Motznick, this is, this is a, uh, a situation that we had. <clears throat> and I, and you, I look out here and I see the volunteers of the community, so I'm going to get to that. 
So we had a situation where we wanted to build a new field. So we actually raised the funds ourselves. We, we brought in uh, heavy equipment and we, we tried to make this work on our own. We thought we had everything together. Um, there were some situations with the fill that fell apart. So we raised the issue 10 years later. Now we get Representative Harry, State Representative Harry Reacher involved, Councilman Motznick involved, and we thought we had the, uh, the monies to make this happen. But also at the same time, the rec center, a new rec center was being built up at Phillips Park. Um, the cost was run over, and therefore they had to take money from our ball field to finish the job at Phillips Park. This can't happen. This can't happen in a major city. You want to be a major player, this can't happen. So I'm challenging you, nine council members, minus one tonight. Um, make this happen fairly. Do whatever it takes. Thank make you. it happen, make, the, make it be you. distributed next fairly. Next speaker, please. Thank you. We have next speaker, uh, the uh, Honorable Darlene Harris. Honorable Darlene Harris, next speaker. Good evening, Council. Darlene Harris, Northside. Uh, I, thank you. <laughs> I just came tonight uh, because this tax has not been passed yet. Even though it was a referendum, it's a tax increase that has to be voted on by you, the members of council, not the mayor, no one else is gonna vote on this, except for you on bill 0091. That's a tax increase. And if I was on council only three months, I sure wouldn't be voting on a tax increase. Matter of fact, all the time that I was on the school board and council, I have never once voted on a tax increase. Yes, this was on a referendum, but everybody that rents got to vote on it. Not the homeowners, not the people that are trying to raise their families in the city of Pittsburgh. We're gonna lose our neighborhoods. I mean, just listen to Carrick. And they're not the only ones. There's a lot of people that couldn't come tonight. And I'm here because I was asked to come. But our parks need help. We have the RAD money to pay for it. But 20% of this money is supposed to go for privatization to the Parks Conservancy. Privatization. Now, I love the Parks Conservancy, but they're there to help fund our parks, not for city taxpayers to pay for their nonprofit um, monies. So I would hope that you think about this. A lot of neighborhoods have been neglected especially in the north side, in the uh, south, in the west end, and part of the east have really been neglected. And giving out $10,000 raises is not helping to not have money here. I mean, 250 million up to right now has been taken out in new bonds. City's headed right back where it was before. And 1.6 million was taken out of a rec center on the north side, which the north side don't even have a rec center. So thank you for your attention tonight, and God bless y'all. Carol Anthony. Next speaker, please, Carol Anthony. She's not here. Ariam Ford. Did I say your name right? Yes. You did. Okay, good. Good evening. My name is Ariam Ford. I'm here representing the Overbrook um, Community Council as its president. I personally um, agree with the parks tax. I voted with it. However, I am in the minority of my group, and I'm going to be playing you some of their comments from our meeting. I do have two questions, one for the council on the behalf of myself. Are the artificial district boundary lines um, of districts the appropriate footprint for exercising equity in Pittsburgh? 
And then for our, our uh, crowd, how far away does someone have to live till they're not your neighbor anymore? Because that matters in this discussion. And so now until the end of my talk, I'll be playing you some comments from my group. And it would be a windfall, a monetary windfall for Overbrook if his plan passed. And so that's not so bad. And I'm not against that, but I want, I actually support the purpose for the tax, how they said they were going to do it to begin with. That's what I voted for. No. So that is Mike, our treasurer. We have Miss Eileen. I'm an East Ender. I grew up in Lincoln Lovington. I spent my childhood in, in Pulse and Pulse, so I appreciate the facilities the city has. Uh, it's just so overwhelmingly lopsided, though. Like one park in the whole South Hills. It, it, the scales aren't like this, they're like this. And I think we deserve some facilities, some repairs. Um, uh, I, I'm a widow, so the, um, the property tax is the most punitive tax. So say you're married, you have a spouse, you both work. You're paying that same $50 to, to working families as a single person. So it hits, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tree tender. I give to a lot of environmental organizations, Nature Conservancy, Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. But if I have a bad year, I could say, well, I can't write as many checks. But with this tax, no matter what, you pay that every year. There's no. And then the last one I have is Miss Carol, who was not able to be with us this evening. So can I say it should really be your public comment because they're not here to register, so we don't even. I know have their um, names and phone numbers and permission. But they for from you, but they did not sign up. So okay. Just want to be clear. I apologize, thank you. Okay, no, I apologize, because I, you can finish your comments, though. Oh, my comments, um, I guess, my professional opinion, I work in the nonprofit environmental justice sector, and as somebody who lives in Overbrook, a really nice neighborhood, and who grew up in Metro DC and not such a nice neighborhood, I know that perspective matters in this conversation, so I encourage everyone to take a field trip across town and check out parks, and then maybe come back and let's talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Phyllis Diviana. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having this for us. My name is Phyllis Diviano from Beachview. I made a lot, a lot of notes, changes. There's a lot been said, a lot of good comments. Uh, I'm going to try to stick to a few important points, so I may not be looking at you. I'm trying to figure out which one. OK, so I, I'm a resident of District 4 and president of the Beachview Area Concerned Citizens. Canceled our monthly meeting, which we've been having over 30 years, so people could come to this. But I'm really here because of a comment I heard when I viewed City Council on February 25th. And the comments were made by Dan Booker, the past, immediate past um, president, he's on the board of PPC. He was asked a question by our councilman, Coghill. Why is it that my district voted so heavy against it? Now, this is a verbatim answer. I don't know. We did a bad job marketing the plan in your district, I guess. Or there's a stronger anti-tax feeling in your district. Or people in your district don't care quite as much about their parks, parks as elsewhere. It's all speculation. I don't know. Wow, very telling. District 4 voted 75% overall against this legislation. Some residents thought this would be a good idea. I'm not sure all of the 25% were informed enough to know what they were voting for. And I wonder if they feel sorry now. With the ambiguity in this initiative, I don't feel that the referendum should have ever been allowed to be added to the ballot. Um, the problem with the apathy in some of the neighborhoods is, if you say something, you'll be called names. I've been called many. If you speak up, maybe you're not in favor of equity. That's not true. We should have a right to speak up. Our neighborhood uh, doesn't have a lot of amenities, but we appreciate all that it does. And so this election was based on marketing incomes. Really? Is that a fair election? Is that what you teach children? Justice was served. Could it be that those not paying the property tax were targeted? Maybe I can imagine why he said these things, such as there was 
um, more push in the eastern neighborhoods where a lot of regional parks are located or outreach to underserved neighborhoods to get votes without them knowing the real facts. His comments could stem from admitting that they dropped the ball and not actually admit the citizenry in District 4 actually voted no because they were against the tax. I take issue with the numbers. The equation started with a limited number of people in surveys. In a city of 301, 148 people, only 10,000 were said to have been engaged, and that was by the PPC. Um, I attended meetings from the very beginning. The first one I went to was in December of 2018, and Jane has talked about the director, uh, has been talked about how diligent they were, and yes, they contacted community groups. Thank um, you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you. You can leave your, your phone. <laughs> Brian Fogel. Brian Fogel. Christy Dodds. Christy Dodds. Sharita Bush. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Charita Bush of the Manchester area. Um, leading up to the park tax vote, I spent the better part of last year attending listening tour meetings and signing up to become a park champion and vetting the intentions of the Pittsburgh Park Conservancy. I voted for the tax and after it passed, I realized, thanks to my councilman, that I didn't fully understand the definition of home rule charter. Um, in addition, I felt that it was a uh, lack of transparency in the process. Uh, no offense to you all, because I appreciate all that you do uh, for your city of Pittsburgh residents, but I didn't realize that you would have the final say on the subsequent funds and the funds usage. If I've known, I would have vetted the thoughts of my neighborhood councilmen and other of you that I've had the pleasure of meeting. Um, the Park Trust Fund was attractive because it was a collaboration with the city of Pittsburgh. Um, I realized the city of Pittsburgh lacks the resources uh, to maintenance the park each year, and therefore I agree with the creation of the Park Trust Fund, with the caveat that it remains a fair and transparent collaboration. Uh, with the authorizing the funds, you also have the authorization to dictate how the funds are spent. Um, and I'd like to offer some thoughts as you go about making decisions. Uh, many Pittsburgh, city of Pittsburgh residents, including myself, were ignorant in assuming that the PPC had more authorizing authority than they do. Uh, but we heard from them and we agreed what they proposed to do. Um, I'm unaware of your intentions made ahead of time and I think that should be taken in consideration to avoid any appearance of impropriety. Uh, the passion of the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy is appreciated and desired. They've positively impacted our parks minus having structured funding sources. Um, the Conservancy has researched 165 parks within the city and have potential plans. My hope is that you will allow them to an integral part in the process. In a city that boasts some of the highest taxes, they got us to vote on an increase and that's saying something. I'd request you that you avoid the temptation of splitting all the distribution of the funds among your represented communities. Some community parks need a little, some need more. Um, and my hope is that there's transparency in determining each community, um, each community requiring the funds and the funds be granted. Uh, some may need to install lighting. Some may have a graffiti issue even before looking at uh, park improvements. Lastly, um, through the splitting of funds between the parks and recreation and uh, parks and recreation, public works. I, I don't, I think that seems unfair. And in closing, I have faith in you all to keep the collaboration between the city and, to tra and keep this as a Thank fair, you. transparent investment strategy, strategy for our parks Thank that you. will work for everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is there another page? No, it was. Bob Morton, Bob Morton.
Karen Morton. Good evening, Council. My Good name evening. is Karen Morton. I live at 1756 Lonergan Street, which is in Beachview, the 19th Ward. I'm a city girl. I was born and raised in Mount Washington, and for the last 30 years, I've lived across the street from Pauline Park. So I'm not opposed to paying taxes at all, but when I look out my window on Wednesday morning, I can see that the city picked up my garbage. When it snows, the city salted my street. In the summer, the city cuts the grass at Pauline Park. So I would just be concerned to look out my window and not see the conservancy doing anything. That's my concern, and I would appreciate if you would make it your concern also, because I'm not opposed to paying taxes. I just want to see where my taxes go. Thank you. Rocky Franciscus. Eileen, Eileen for Polly next. After, after Rocky, Eileen. Hi, my name is Rocky Franciscus and I live in 1705 Leland Street in the Pittsburgh 10 area. Uh, other than being here, to help Anthony get his fair share. I'm here to tell a few stories. And uh, one concern. Now, 50 years ago, when WPXI was WIIC, we marched around the block to get a park built in a vacant city lot. Mayor Calgary honored us and gave us that park. Now, through the years, it's been taken care of, but the last couple of years, since uh, the, the kids are a lot different. And this year, last summer, the, um, uh, fund the block, what was it? Love Your Block program, which is a charity from Home Depot came down and rebuilt that whole park. Not even two days later, these kids come down, they stole iron pipes from an old uh, trampoline out of somebody's yard and were banging them down there and ruining the park. Now my concern, they were my stories, my concern is that we need to have some more policing in these parks. Now when they were doing this with the pipes, I went down and yelled at them. They threw the pipes down. I went back up to Haas. 10 minutes later, bang, bang, bang. Called the cops, cops came, took the pipes. And then one of the parents or an older brother or something accosted me and said, you got a lot of nerve calling the police on a seven year, on a bunch of seven year olds. Well, you know, nobody's gonna take care of them parks. And if the neighbors can't do anything, they have to have more uh, policing. And now when I was growing up, we had those policemen in the Broncos who would go from park to park. It was two of them in the South Hills. And they kept that park pretty damn clean. One had a dog and one didn't. But they did, they kept them parks clean. So, I mean, that's my idea. If you're gonna put the money into the parks, get some more, if you have to hire a couple cops from this money, do it. If not, have the city put out a couple extra bucks to get a couple more policemen in the Broncos and police in the park. That's my idea. All right, please. Eileen Papali. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi, Eileen. Nice to see everybody. I, my name is Adi Papali. Um, I live at 1525 Merrick Avenue. That's 15226. Um, and I've resided in Council District 4 for 34 years and I'm a longtime former resident of District 9. Um, 51 years ago, I started my first job at $1.10 an hour where the current Google building is located. So it would be nice to have a couple pennies for our district. I love our parks and I'm a tree tender, a member of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, and on our local beautification committee. By all means, city council members should maintain control of any park tax funds as they are directly elected by the residents and represent us. 
However, I was greatly dismay dismayed to see how our southern neighborhoods were almost entirely overlooked. Many of us struggle to pay our taxes and bills. We are not immune to high student loans, deaths of spouses, home and auto repair bills. Some are under the very false assumption that there is no or little need here. Don't pit neighborhoods against one another or neighbor against neighbor. Two-income households pay the same park tax as a single homeowner who most likely has less disposable income. The scales of justice here are not just slightly off balance, they are almost totally balanced. You can't have everything fair and equal all the time, but you know, we need something, some kind of balance here. Um, a child currently in kindergarten in District 4 would be approaching their middle school years before they would see any of this money spent here. No, nothing for you. This reminds me of the Title I funding situation years ago when our local comprehensive school got nothing even though they were the most overcrowded elementary school in the city and to compound the issue we had a 50% poverty level equal and exceeding those schools that received hundreds of thousands of dollars. It, it always seems like there's something. Um, you can't tell by a neighborhood if there's poverty or um, there, there's issues everywhere. Investment that truly can for children come from parents, love and security, discipline and instruction, a sense of worth. Uh, couple that with quality outdoor recreation and I believe you have a winning formula. Let's set all our children up for successful lives. Don't short change any district. Don't turn your back on District 4. Thank you all so much. Dean Love. Dean Love. Jonathan Nato. Natal? What is it? Natal. Here. Uh, good evening, counselors. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, my name is Jonathan Natal. I live at 858 Gladys Avenue in Beachview, uh, Councilman Coggill's district. And uh, I'm a city park user and supporter. Uh, and I'm also a dues paying member of the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. Uh, I live one house up from the city park, and I know that uh, myself and other residents frequently use it. It's a, an asset to our community. Uh, the Parks Trust Fund, supported by the new parks tax, represents a significant amount of money, bringing you know, 10, 11 million bucks a year. And I think we all want that money to be allocated in a fair and effective way. Uh, this is where there's a role for city council. Uh, with no disrespect to the Parks Conservancy and acknowledging the good work they've done in our parks, the parks are public assets, and the public through accountable elected officials should have a say. Public-private partnerships can and have been beneficial to Pittsburgh, but to be most successful, they need to be well-managed, be transparently run, and win broad public support. Uh, as a city resident and taxpayer, I want my elected city officials to not just serve as rubber stamps, but to provide oversight and to be meaningfully involved in the process. Thank you. Dennis Klein. Dennis Klein. Angela Klein. Marty Langford's not here. Uh, Stacy Branch. Good evening, members of City Council. My name is Stacy Branch. My name is Stacy Branch, and I reside at 4037 Portman Avenue in Observatory Hill area. Is that not working? Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Okay. Are we good now? Okay. See, my time's almost up. Thank you. Uh, listed as, as opposed. opposed, not comment. Thank you very if we much. Could switch that, please. Okay. Good evening, members of City Council. My name is Stacy Branch. I reside at 4037 Portman Street in the Observatory Hill area. Back on October 23rd, I spoke to the members of the City Council about my opposition to the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy tax tax referendum. Excuse me. I express my concerns that there are too many city residents struggling right now to pay their current bills, and that this tax increase could pose a financial disaster for some of these city residents. I agree that the parks do need additional funding, but this isn't the way it should have went through. 
I am still against the Parks Trust Fund because of how quickly this referendum was put on the ballot. Not enough residents were able to understand that their real estate taxes would be increasing and that an outside partnership would be overseeing this. Yet here we go once again, another meeting being scheduled. And where are all the other city residents? Did they, were they made aware about this meeting? I think not. Let me ask you this question. In, if someone you didn't know gave you, gave, said, give me your paycheck, and I will put it into an account for you, and I'll pay some of your bills, whenever, would you allow this to happen? I think not. Well, that's what millions and millions of our taxpayers' dollars will be giving to an account that no one knows how it's going to be spent or controlled Who's going to be doing the hiring on these projects? Are they going to be union workers? Are they going to be able to choose their friends to do these jobs? I request that City Council not pass this legislation until there is an exact plan as to how the funds will be overseen, managed, and allow, and how all of these dollars are going to be distributed evenly. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Thank you. Charlene Sanner. Charlene, I see you now. Hi, Charlene. Good evening, Charlene Sainer, Beachview. If city politics and policies were utopian, and if utopias were a reality, none of us would ever need concern ourselves about transparency and fair distribution of funds and services. I love our parks and green spaces and utilize them throughout the city. I agree that residents should have a stewardship role in maintaining our parks. I even think that all persons who work in the city should be assessed a modest $5 a year that should be allocated, allocated to our parks. No one threw eggs at me for that. But when the private Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy successfully spent their time and money in getting the parks referendum on the ballot, I voted no. Now, why would a park enthusiast who believes that residents should contribute to our parks vote no to this referendum? Because of the untold and because of the lack of transparency. Because no one should be forced to contribute to a cause in which they may never benefit. We elect council members because we trust them to act in the best interest of the constituency. To suggest that a private organization can decide what's needed in our neighborhoods better than the persons we elect is insulting and undermining. I've been to many of the long neglected parks that are listed for capital funding. However, ignoring other neighborhoods to right or wrong is not the answer. In Beachview, an entire athletic association is at risk of permanent demise because Vianucci Park needs new drainage, fencing, bathroom sod, concessions, and more. Yet Vianucci nor any other park in District 4 is being considered for funding in the next few years. The rolling effect of not having improvements to Vinucci is youth are being denied an opportunity for the academic, emotional, social, and health benefits that sports provide. A neglected park is a right place for substance use and other illicit behavior, which leads to frightened neighbors who sell their houses at a loss and hightail it to the burbs. Now, how is that for a shrinking park fund? And to those who may be here that represent the Pittsburgh Park Conservancy, I appreciate the partnership you have with our city in which I have personally benefit. But, Public money should stay in the hands of the public, not private organizations. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you. Marilyn Stack. Marilyn Stack. Marilyn Stack. Tom Stack. Tom Stack. 
Danielle Robinson, Graham Robinson, Brenda Smith. Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Brenda Smith. Uh, I live at 1934 Beechwood Boulevard in Squirrel Hill, and I'm the director of the Nine Mile Run Watershed Association. Our organization supported the creation of the Parks Trust Fund. Much of our work is in Frick Park, and we see every day the needs that the city budget can't fulfill, and that's a rad park, a park that receives additional funding beyond what most of the community parks do. So I know the situation has to be worse in many of the small community parks, and we heard a lot of people tonight talking about all the things that are lacking in their parks. I'm proud of the people of Pittsburgh for choosing to pay a little bit more in taxes in order to enhance both the physical infrastructure of the parks, but also the programming available to the public. Nobody has really talked much about the fact that some of the, some of the funding is intended to go to enhance programming for everybody. Um, I mean, a lot of people have talked about all the things that need to be addressed in their parks, but without this tax, they're not going to be because there just isn't enough money to even keep up with basic maintenance, day-to-day -day -day maintenance, let alone any special projects. The Parks Conservancy held dozens of meetings over a period of a year, attended by hundreds of people to both learn about the needs of all of the parks uh, and gather information, but also to explain their ideas for how to prioritize those needs. Um, and and uh, uh, hundreds of other people also filled out surveys online about the needs of the parks. The Conservancy came up with a very detailed um, rubric for how to prioritize the different parks and their needs, taking into account things like the distance to parks for you know, various um, neighborhoods, tree canopy cover, asthma rates, many other metrics. So kind of putting all those things together um, in an attempt to be as fair as it's possible to be in prioritizing the distribution of the funds. Um, and I think above all what they learned is what Mr. Davis said earlier, which is that equal is not necessarily equitable. Um, you know, there are parks and neighborhoods that have had disinvestment for decades and their needs might be greater than other places that have had a lot of attention. Um, regardless of what district, that, which council district they're in. So I just would urge you to work closely with the Parks Conservancy to work out a truly equitable plan for how to use these funds. And finally, I just want to say that it's really distressing to just hear the level of rancor and suspicion that people are communicating about um, the intentions behind the Parks Conservancy in doing this. I know a lot of the people on staff there, and I know that they work hard every day with no other goal or uh, hidden agenda in mind, but Nick. to make life in the G. city L. better Johnson, for everybody. G.L. Johnson. G.L. Johnson. Good evening. Um, G.L. Johnson of Spring Garden Valley. Uh, do we have Spring Garden in the house? Um, okay, so I like, par um, like parks. Um, I'm cool with taxes. You know, definitely wish we could have gotten an income tax, but this is better than the sales tax uh, that some other speakers proposed. Um, the districting program, to me, it reeks of old school, petty, fiefdom-based politics that really takes us back to the Boss Tweed days. But certainly, I would rather, in a second, take the Boss Tweed days over the alternative uh, that seems to be on the table, and that's putting public money in partnership with the funders of hate groups. And here I'm talking about the Colcom Foundation. It's a big funder of the, of the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy to the tune of millions of dollars over the past decade and an even bigger funder of Southern Poverty Law Center certified hate groups. These include the American, the American Immigration Control Foundation, which has likened immigration to a military conquest with the effect of substantially replacing the native population, as well as the website VDARE, which regularly publishes articles by prominent white nationalists race scientists, and anti-Semites. Uh, their latest entry in the video section, if you go to their website, which I do not recommend, being whites have rights. It's time to get serious about secession. Uh, so a Colcom official in the newspaper article, I think the Post-Gazette, maybe the Times, um, said that after the uh, Market Square debacle of the holidays of 2008, 2018 happened, 
uh, and they had to take their name off a of display there. He contacted most of Colcom's local grantees and explained what its positions were on immigration. And the quote from him is, I can confidently tell you that essentially all of them said, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Someone has to advance this conversation. Uh, Mr. Rowe, that's R-O-H-E, claimed. So I'm curious to see if those are the views of the Parks Conservancy. When I asked the Parks Conservancy leader, she might have been the executive director um, at that meeting uh, in East Liberty before the referendum, she essentially threw her hands up saying she can't denounce every funder she disagrees with and pointed to the hiring of a diversity director. Needless to say, a diversity director, one person there, is hardly enough to reassure me and hopefully not any of you all. Uh, so even if they weren't you know, in partnership with these hate groups, these funders of hate groups, uh, we shouldn't be taking you know, public money and giving it to a private foundation. You know, this, money, this money, these jobs, these park renovations should be done by union employees, by public employees. And I think that's something that this Bernie Sanders socialists and the make care great again people, I, I think we can agree on that. Um, but if that were the only issue, I would have just dropped Congressman Wilson the line. But I think the hate group issue, the funders of hate groups, I think that's a connection that needs to be explored more. And it has been explored if you read it in the, the coverage of this morning's press conference at the Gateway T station against the Colcom Foundation. Thank you, Council, and thank you, everyone here. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Gonzalez. And see Lisa here. Lisa Gonzalez. That exhausts our list of registered speakers. Now we'll give um, people that would like to have a, m a minute to speak, we'll give you one minute to speak. If you come to the podium, please line up if you want to speak. Hello. Welcome. Hello, how Welcome. are you? <laughs> I'm Heather McLean, an environmental justice organizer for One Pennsylvania. I'm also a resident of Beachview in District 4, but I'm going to deviate a little bit from my neighbors here. City Council has so much oversight power here. The amendment to the Home Rule Charter includes a chance for matching funds from private donors, which Pittsburgh's Par Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy will no doubt bring in. I'm concerned about the fact that Parks Conservancy has taken millions from the Colcom Foundation, as JL said. They and the Colcom Foundation funds many environmental projects as well as anti-immigration and white nationalist groups with a belief that overpopulation caused by immigration is responsible for our environmental problems. Our parks projects cannot be funded by hate. City Council has the power of oversight here. We need you to be vigilant with every aspect. Private funding must be transparent and must not come from Colcom. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Kim Toplitsky. I'm the president of the Polish Hill Civic Association. We attended both rounds of the parks listening tour. In fact, I believe that our neighborhood had the largest turnout of any neighborhood at one of the parks listening tour events. Following those, we endorsed the parks plan, voted for the parks plan, support the parks plan. The thing that I'm most excited about and that our neighborhood is most excited about is that the largest portion of the budget of the parks plan is for maintenance. Maintenance projects that would be done by city employees across the entire city in every single district of the city. Um, this is a great plan. I think it's going to help solve some of the major problems at the Department of Public Works right now, which is understaffed and under-resourced. And this is a way to actually bring those resources back into the city to serve city residents and improve all of our parks all across the entire city. We also support an equity-based plan. Our park at West Penn Park is desperately in need of maintenance and upgrades, and I believe that this plan, when implemented, will actually help achieve some of those. The people of Pittsburgh has, have spoken, the referendum passed, it's time to implement this plan and actually let it happen, get the money back into public works, and make this plan a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kate Marr, and I live in Central Oakland, District 3. I'm here in support of the Pittsburgh Parks tax as well as uh, working with the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy in its administration. I've been a Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy sponsor for several years. I've also lived in the city for over 25 years and I see the benefit of having parks in our, in our environment and having people being able to enjoy those parks. I've also seen over the years uh, lots of broken things, lots of deferred maintenance, lots of issues that really just have not been able to be addressed because of uh, the lack of funds. And so through this tax, and responsible and accountable voters knew what they were voting on when they pushed that button 
in the ballot, you know, on the machine, they knew what they were voting for, they should have, said that they wanted this tax. I also agree with other folks here, though, that equal isn't always equitable. Things haven't been fair in the past. And so when we look at uh, parks that Thank are you. falling apart, um, any further they speakers? need to be prioritized. Those Thank you. Are there any further speakers? One time, no, no, well, no, I no. didn't get my name on the record. Can I just give my address? I didn't give my address. Okay. It's Anthony Moreno, 3932 McClure Avenue. That's okay. Any further speakers? Seeing none, we're going to hear from council members. We're going to, I know this end has a lot more to say, and I have a lot to say, so we're going to start with uh, Council President. No. So, so first and foremost, thank you all for being here. I've said this before, I'll repeat it again. This is the favorite thing we get to do here is when the public comes into the chamber and engages with us directly. Um, and so a couple thoughts that I have and a couple themes that were repeated uh, again and again tonight, and it really was about the equitable distribution of the dollars and that the, um, uh, your concerns are our concerns. There's no question about that. We are the fiduciary agents of the city. That is the, sole, that is the first purpose of the council here. We manage the budget. And those dollars that are to be collected are publicly collected tax dollars. And they reside at the council table and it is through debate and discussion uh, here uh, amongst council members that the ultimate decisions will be made for the distribution of those dollars. The, uh, the idea that um, we could in any way work to undo the referendum I think is a terrible um, uh, precedence that we could set. Um, many of us could argue how and why the um, the referendum either passed or failed within our council districts. Mine was ra razor sharp margin by which it did pass. I would argue it was equally as many people for as it was against. But the public did speak and it is our election system and I think to even go anywhere near not approving the referendum would be a terrible precedence to set. Having said that, Again, we are the fiduciary agents of the city. Those are publicly collected tax dollars and they reside here. Our chair of Parks and Rec, Councilman Burgess, is not present this evening. Um, and I think it would have been incredibly important for him to be present for this public hearing because he has a bill on the table that he's asking for our support that would simply accept the Parks Conservancy Plan um, in its completeness without any discussion amongst members, which I think would be absolutely disastrous. We would be negating our responsibility to oversee those dollars and to hear from our constituency directly as to how those dollars need to be spent. You have my solemn vow, I will not vote that piece of legislation and I will work very hard to encourage my council, my fellow members, not to support that legislation. It shirks our duty. We have to oversee those dollars. It will reside here. So. First things first, we have to acknowledge the referendum and we have to create the trust fund, which is what this public hearing is largely about, uh, create the public trust fund by which those dollars will be collected and housed. But that's just the beginning of the process. The real work will begin and the rubber will hit the road as those dollars are collected and we amongst ourselves decide how those, uh, those dollars are ultimately distributed. So please rest assured that this council is going to act responsibly and in your best interest in how we manage these dollars to bring you the highest and best benefit for the taxes you're paying. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Councilwoman Strasburger. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone who is here tonight and everyone who was here tonight. I hope that um, Councilman Coghill will pass that along to many of the constituents from District 4 that came out because I really do appreciate you taking your evening to, to, to be here and to tell us what you think, um, and I hear you. So, you know, we've been under basically this equivalent of bankruptcy for the last um, de decade plus, Act 47, which meant that a lot of our amenities have seen disinvestment, our parks, our buildings, our roads, and we're finally out of that, and now we can start to finally invest back into our amenities again, and that's a really good thing. And um, regardless of whether you supported the tax or not, we now have, it's passed, and we have that money, and we take it very, I take it very responsibly as do, um, uh, very seriously um, as to how we, uh, how we spend that and how, what the plan looks like. Um, I do feel very strongly that not splitting the funds nine equal ways per district would ultimately hurt 
District 4 and District 1 and a lot of the people who are in this room. I know that you have projects that you haven't seen funded in the last decades um, and, and for many years leading up to today, but just think, I represent District 8. That's Squirrel Hill, that's Shadyside, that's Point Breeze in Oakland. And the two main parks that are in our district are RAD funded parks, so they get money over and above um, what the city allocates. We don't need the same amount that, that other districts do. That's just a fact. We don't need the same amount. Do we need some for Mellon Park? Yes. For upkeep of the other parks? Yes. But we don't need year after year after year the same amount that District 4 needs and that District 9 needs and that District 1 needs and all the other districts. So ultimately, dividing it up equally, I think you'd be shooting yourself in the foot um, because you would just, it, it would be unfair in the end. So the whole equal isn't always equitable resonates with me. Um, some of the people I wanted to, whose comments I wanted to address aren't here anymore, but there seems to be this, this, this uh, understanding that um, just because we would be voting for a trust fund to be able to accept the taxpayer dollars into a fund, that there would also be a trust fund board, that they are somehow linked, and that's not necessarily true. So I just wanted to dispel that myth that we decide whether there is a separate third party board or not. And as far as I'm concerned, from the direction that I see that this body going, um, I don't think that we're in support of a board. We're in support of council making the decisions as to how the money is spent. So that's just one thing I wanted to dispel as well. Um, uh, whether it's through the regular budget process or whether it's through another process is a different matter. But um, you know, if it's through the budget process where we decide every single year how money is spent, that, I agree, needs to be a more transparent, a longer, more participatory project process so that in forums like these throughout the year, not just right at the budget season, we can be talking about how to equitably distribute the funds, not just for, um, from the money that comes from this tax, but all taxpayer dollars. And, um, you know, I hear a lot about, I've heard a lot tonight about Brookline Rec Center and Phillips Park, certainly talked to Councilman Cockle about that. Through a process like the regular budget process, we can come together as a body and figure out what priorities need to be um, met. And clearly those are some that I'm hearing. As a council member, I want to, you know, I want to help you get your needs met in your district. So um, let's talk about that process. But I don't think it necessarily has to be a every single year an equal amount of this tr trust fund money going to every single district. Um, also, I just want to say we're not necessarily the body that's going to be implementing the plan. So, you know, we, we don't even really have the power to, to say what the plan will be. We can put bound boxes around what um, can't be done with the money. We can say we will never privatize the parks. We can say other things like that. But in terms of actually implementing the plan that the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy put together, we're not the ones implementing that, so we don't have as much power in that regard as I think you think we have. Um, no, there's no back and forth with council. Uh, I also, it's not a, I, if I haven't said this already, it's not a foregone conclusion that the Parks Conservancy is going to get the money. Um, I, I've heard that a lot, that you think that the Parks Conservancy is just automatically going to get a certain amount of money, and that's not necessarily a foregone conclusion. Um, as far as, again, as far as I'm concerned, it's going to be council figuring out who, the, where the money goes on a year-to-year -year basis um, through the regular budget process or however we figure that, that system out. And to um, Mr. Krigo's points, yes, I am prepared to support hiring more union workers to maintain our parks, more city-related, city, city, uh, city workers who are union workers, and to the extent um, that, we are, that we have to subcontract out for projects, also um, making sure that those contracts include union workers. So just wanted to address some of those points I heard. Again, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman is between you two. All right, okay, I'll go next. Thank you. One thing real fast, it's unrelated. Uh, Councilman uh, Wilson needed to step out. There's a slight emergency in his council district. I didn't want you to interpret that as some level of disinterest, but he needed to leave the meeting, and I just wanted to make sure you knew that.
Everyone's okay there. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I'm glad to, uh, also that everyone came out tonight. I know it's a burden to come downtown, to come out and spend your evening here. And it's always valuable to hear directly from the citizens. And I think also for all of you to hear each other as well. It's a really robust part of our democracy. That's why we're here. That's why we're your local government. You know where to find us and you can come talk to us and we're always happy to hear from you. Um, and so I wanna echo a couple of things that the other member said and that we heard tonight in our comments. I'm really glad to hear the public support for spending the money being allocated under council control. That city council is the place where we have all of the public guarantee that it's a transparent process, that you get notification, that you know where to find us, that you can see what we're doing, you can watch it on TV. That is why we have all this process with legislation, that we have legislation that you are able to read, that you can come and we can hear from you, we have phone numbers, you can reach us. Not many of us here have ever been to a Parks Conservancy board meeting, right? And I, that's the concern that I hear is that no matter how wonderful we think the people are who work at that nonprofit today, um, there is still, it's still not a public body. Um, and so this is the place for oversight of public funds. Um, and certainly there are cases where partnerships with private entities, nonprofit or for-profit, um, can change and not go very well. Um, and it's the public that needs to keep responsibility. I also heard a lot of support for spending that money to build up the strength of our own public departments with our public employees that are union employees, and I'm glad to hear that as well. I absolutely agree. Um, and uh, I want to speak for a moment to the role of um, the data-driven plan that was advertised by the Parks Conservancy. It's true that a majority of the funds in that plan were to be spent on the kind of maintenance and repair that would be distributed around the city, which I'm glad to see. But it's also true that a substantial amount of that money, some 20% or more, to be targeted at um, only 20 of the 165 parks that are for capital improvements. And I, uh, we had a post agenda where we had the, the authors, the, the data analysts themselves and from Philadelphia that the Parks Conservancy's paid to do that study. Um, and so I asked them very direct questions. I said, okay, so in those 20 parks that you have the 10 minute walk shed, so this zone, zones around each of these 20 parks, of the city population, how many people of the total city population are in that, the targeted area? And they couldn't answer. They were paid $55,000 and flew in from Philadelphia to provide expert testimony to us last week. Um, and uh, then I asked them, okay, so of the children in the city of Pittsburgh, how many children? I, that, was, that was supposed to be the easy question that was the, my kind of opening question, and they couldn't answer. And so then I followed up by asking them how many children were in the areas that they were targeting for these capital improvements. They couldn't answer that. They're going to get back to me. It's been a week. They haven't, they haven't still given us those numbers. Um, and then even more concerning, uh, my harder question was, um, I showed a map of uh, all the poor households in the city that I had just kind of looked myself side by side to where their targeted 20 parks are and where are the poor families in the city. Of poor households in the city, nearly 80% are female-headed households with children. And that's some are six, six or 7,000 households in the city. And we know this from a study done by the Women and Girls Foundation a couple, just a couple of years ago called uh, Femisphere. And you look at the two maps, they don't line up very well. And so I said, okay, so of the poor households, if we are, you are the analysts who used data to give us an equitable plan that you're proposing we adopt, how many of those households are in your targeted area? Of course, they couldn't answer, right? Um, and so I, I demanded their data. I had been waiting for it some time. I had, and they finally shared the raw data with me. And so I'm sharing it around as much as I can to try to get someone who can look at those maps. And really, I, I, I have to question it, right? I mean, the academic standard of, of a data-driven study is that someone else can replicate and get the same results you did. Um, so they finally shared the raw data just a couple of days ago, just this week, in fact. Um, and so I'm really eager to see what kind of equity they actually have in their plan. Right now, it doesn't look very equitable. Um, in fact, one of the things that they did tell me, again, they didn't give me still any of those numbers in the follow-up from last week. Um, 
they did admit, like, gosh, you know, we kind of overestimated how many people in the city are within a 10-minute walk of a park. So even out of the 165 parks, they said, you know, we had kind of advertised that 9% of the city, only 9% were lived outside of, you know, mm -hmm. 165 parks. It turns out it's, they admit in their email to me this week, it's more like 30%. So really, even in looking at the 165 parks, they were leaving out 100,000 people in the city. So it's really, you know, they, they took two thirds of the city and then prioritized the parks. Um, and so I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Okay. Um, and so they advertised Thank that you. they had a data-driven plan. Um, but hypoth you know, hypo I'm not saying they made it all up, but hypothetically they could have made it all up because we haven't actually seen the data yet and we're just getting to see it now. Um, and that has happened in, you know, in the history of the world where people have just made up numbers. So that is something that I think it's this body's responsibility to not just take a bill of sales, you know, you know wholesale or whatever that, <laughs> that phrase is. But to really, it's, it's, our, it's our duty to you to question and verify, right? Especially before we spend your tax dollars. Um, so stay in touch um, and we're, we're gonna continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman, call uh, I promise to be really brief. Um, yeah, that's what the other three said. No, I, I do, honestly. I mean, a lot of people were here and said what I was thinking tonight. So first of all, I wanna thank everybody for being here, whether you're for the tax or against the tax. I just want to thank you for taking time out of your day and being here this evening. And I got to tell you, Councilman Cross, I had no idea so many people from my district were going to be here tonight. <laughs> I say that jokingly, but I and, told him he stacked the room. Yeah, right. So I just want to reiterate just a couple things that were that were said. Um, first and foremost, you know, to me, this was wrong from the beginning. When a private company comes in and they decide to levy a tax on the citizens of Pittsburgh, it's wrong. Okay, that's my, th my, my thought. And I feel it's our duty as council members now to protect the future. And as I believe Mr. Gianella said, what is gonna happen? Who's, who's gonna line up next? If the conservancy gets their way, and I believe that their way is, looks a lot different than what we think, why would they put a million dollars into the campaign? Why would they you know, put their own plan out? They obviously have plans that I don't even know about. And getting back to the anal analyzation that they had, that Ms. Gross was talking about, they failed to, to even ask me. They spent $55,000 to analyze you know, the parks and what, what they feel the parks need, but they failed to ask the council, at least this councilman, as to what I felt was needed. And all they really had to do was ask the mayor's office, because I've been putting in for capital projects for my parks, because I know my parks much better than the Conservancy or some analysts that they hire from Philadelphia, I will say. Um, I'll say this, uh, Councilwoman Strasberger, I just wanna address, you know, you said we may be shortchanging ourselves, and I've said that often, you know, we have big, small parks in my district, bigger needs, I feel, than probably a lot of the other districts. But there's an old saying, and honestly, this is the way I feel, and of course, I am fighting for an equal distribution. There's enough money to go around. This is a million dollars a year. Once we're reassessed someday, and we will be, it's going to go to $2 million. If council districts in your district doesn't need that money, I am all for you being equitable and using your portion of that any way we want. But, but I ask that you respect our wishes, and I think they made it pretty clear here that we feel we need an equal distribution in order to take care of the projects that I've been begging for over the last couple of years. And there's an old saying, one in the hand is better than two in the bush. And you know what, if I can have my fair share, you'll never hear from us again, I can tell you that. So thanks for being here. Thank you. Do you want to say anything? I'm good. Okay. okay. So everybody else was said they were quick, and I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to be quick. No, just kidding. No, I'll, I'll be quick for well, as quick as I can be. I just want to say there was a couple of things I do want to um, say that we that I heard throughout the meeting. But there's so much here to that to correct and to address. But I I want to first thank Councilman Caldwell because I, I got to be honest. I mean, he cares so much about this community and uh, his district, and we we, we work together in bringing a lot of attention to the south southwest of the city of Pittsburgh and and I appreciate the partnership with him and I appreciate what he's done tonight um, advocating for his district although although he and I 
he, he and I may not agree on the, on the distribution. We definitely agree on the council should have control of the dollars because we are your voice. We are the voice of the public. And without our voice, then you don't have a voice. And I, from the very beginning, I spoke out against this, the process of this tax. Um, I didn't, I felt like there was setting a, a dangerous precedence that we were going down a path where anyone could just decide that they want to have a tax on for some purpose in the city of Pittsburgh. And we're, you know, subjected to paying these taxes if a few voters show up more than, you know, than, than not to say yes, more than not. And if you see, I mean, that's not a great percentage of voters that, that approve this. It's just not. And to say that this is a mandate for the public is just not accurate. Uh, and so for me, I just think that there's a lot, there's a lot to be said. I've never been supportive of i'm always very cautious of any type and everybody knows this about me when it comes to nonprofits, when it comes to um public private partnerships i want to make sure that we're not that those things are not superseding the voice of the public ever ever and i want to make sure that when we pick partners to work with that they understand their places to partner with the city and to take the guidance and the direction from the city, not the other way around. And so I think that there's a lot I have concerns with. And, and I'll be honest, I've had a nonprofit in my district with a lot of issues, and I report them to the IRS, the FBI, the Attorney General, the U.S. Attorney General, and finally it was the IRS who came after them and, and shut them because they, uh, they took $5 million for development money and didn't have pub, you know, public monthly public meetings. And all, there was just a lot of things, selling insider selling property to board members and all sorts of things. So when it comes to the to non I always have a red flag up to me. I mean, it's always something that I'm going to look out for because we've had the worst of the worst in, in, in our area. Um, but having said that, I'm not saying that this nonprofit is the worst of the worst. They have done a lot of good things in the city, but I also think we could do some of these things without the you know, other without the nonprofits and without this this organization because the fact of the matter is I'm not crazy about some of the things that are happening in our parks. I'm not crazy about anybody having to spend money for anything in our parks and some of those things or paying an exorbitant rent um, that goes to a nonprofit or having a, a for-profit business in our parks. So I'm not for some of those things, but maybe other people are. I'm not. So I, it, it, I think if we want this to be a good working relationship, council has to keep control over this funding. But I, there's a couple things I do want to say. Council, this year we allocated, I think it was around 30, um, was it $30 million for our parks this year? So we allocated a lot of money this year to our parks. So it's not as if we're not investing in our parks. We are investing in our parks. What we haven't really had a lot of money, pardon me? Program. It's programming, yes, programming, and and there's other things that you know we'd like to see, see um, addressed. And I, I said this before. I said if the public knew that the choice was raise this tax this time for the parks, raise the tax to increase public safety and public safety services and and the equipment, or to do something you know for children you know with early childhood or something like that. If we gave them those options, they might not have chosen parks is number one or infrastructure total infrastructure because there's a lot of people complaining about things that maybe we could have put the money towards but i said it's almost like you say do you want your right arm cut off your left arm cut off your baby toe so people say their baby toe and then we go back and say this is what they asked for no that was the only option they had so i think that you know not giving a lot of options it, it was kind of it was kind of difficult and a lot of people were, were uncertain about what they were voting for and we've heard from a lot of people who did vote for it who now have a lot of regret but there's a lot of passion on, on all sides of this this issue. Um, but I do want to say that I think that I've worked for Pittsburgh Public Schools. I've worked for nonprofits before. And I will say that I've seen a lot of divide and conquer theories occur. And I think if we are talking about what's best for the East End, we also want to know what's best for the, for the South Hills and the West End and the North Side. There's... I think there's a way for all of us to get a little bit of something and spread the money out and around without dividing and conquering, you know, communities and people. I mean, it's that's just not a good way to work. And I think that, you know, with priorities, we need to sit down with the administration, outline our priorities for our district and make sure we're fighting for one another. Because if nine of us stick together, we're going to get what we want. And so I think that's the biggest key here. And plus, the administration has been open to it. They've been open to working with us on this. So I want to make sure I, I make that very clear. And as a matter of fact, somebody mentioned that, that we're not going to see any funds in District 2. Well, District 2 is number one in the budget in terms of funding this year. So I want to make sure that that's very clear. So um, 
you know, there's a lot that was said. I think there's a lot of anger, a lot of um, hurt. But my thing has been always been that our parks have been really amazing. I think our public works people have done an amazing job. They, our parks were ranked number 23 in the country, so it wasn't as if we were saying, hey, go to that filthy, disgusting park. Our parks were ranked number 23 under Act 47. So with our, our employees struggling, doing as, you know, as much work as they could get, or we could get out of people, humanly possible, they managed to make our parks amazing. So I, I don't want to ever want to minimize the work that they did in, under very difficult times because they really did a great service to the city of Pittsburgh. So with that said, I mean, there's, there's a lot more that I could add into these comments, but I just want to say that I think we're going to continue having some meetings. We had our first meeting with Councilman Burgess and the administration and Councilman Coghill, and we're going to make sure that we advocate for some projects um, across the city of Pittsburgh to be done. The parks plan everybody keeps talking about is a suggestion. suggestion. It is just a suggestion. And they can suggest whatever they want to council. Somebody might want to suggest I become the Queen of England. I don't know. But <laughs> we still get to vote. So I just want to say, um, you know, I think we're going to have a say in making sure that money, dollars are spent across the city. But we also want to make sure money goes to areas that there are there is a lot of need and my concern has always been from day one is that we're that the plan looked like it was following the money not the need and because i think that there was a lot of parks identified in there that were number seven and whatever like i know our towns and park was listed in there in elliott it's a million dollar park well we're in the middle of doing it i mean the money's there the project's underway and and yet it's not listed until i think it's number seven i don't, I don't want to misquote it but so i think that there's a lot to be said and I mean, there are some amazing parks people that do work for the parks, but I, you know, I'm a very jaded person when it comes to comes to this whole thing. So I think we'll work with together, and we'll work with the administration, and we're going to do what the public, want, you know, gave us the direction to do. But we're going to make sure that we keep control, so we can make sure that all of our areas are receiving some help, including um, areas that feel like they've been forgotten. Everybody's been forgotten. We were under Act 47, so we got as much done as we could. So, of course, I think your side of town, start, you know, our side of town, started seeing some decay after we had seen so, much, so many years of great things happening. But I think that you can't deny that there were things in the East End that had been forgotten for decades. So I think that we don't want to minimize the pain that somebody else is having. We want to sit, figure out a way we can work together so nobody has to go through that again and we can work together. So that's it for me. I don't know when this is going to be back on the agenda. Um, maybe um, in two weeks. So we'll, we'll talk about it then after we have our meeting, follow-up meeting with the administration. So that exhausts the work before this council to have a motion to adjourn. Anything else from members? I'm sorry. Yep, so moved. Motion to adjourn. Meetings adjourn.